turn the microphone on. Now I'm on. All right. I have to re you can hear me now. Now everything's being recorded. All right. I'll, last time, last week, I didn't get a chance to finish up the last three slides of fat and oil. So I'm on the last three slides to finish up before I start the new topic today on starch, sauces, and soup. Okay. So we were on this slide. Okay. We talked about how butter is made. Butter actually is made from the cream of the milk. As I said, when you go to the farm, you see that the real milk, whole milk, that comes from the cow, actually is whole milk, very tasty, also very buttery, especially if you drink the first gulpful. You get a lot of the cream because fats, all fats will float at the top. So you're just drinking the, the cream, basically, from the farm when you first drink the, uh, the, the milk at the farm. So butter is actually made from the cream, the top layer of the, of the milk. Um, you see, nowadays, when we get whole milk, it's called homogenized milk. The reason why it's called homogenized milk, do you know what homogenized means? It means that the fat butter fat has been broken up into very, very small particles, very, very small pieces. They in such small pieces that they stay in suspension. And also, milk has a natural phos phospholipid that separates the fat from the rest of the milk. So when you actually agitate milk, whole milk, you're going to break up the fat into small pieces very small, small pieces, and then each fat particle is surrounded by the phospholipid that's naturally occurring. We talked about phospholipid as an emulsifier. It actually has two components. What are they? The two components are what? Phospholipid is, yeah. Lipid is a fat component, phospholipid. The phosphorus part, it's a what? Hydrophilic, hydrophilic liking water. Hydrophobic part is a lipid part. So that acts as an emulsifier. So all these part, fat particles stay in suspension, surrounded by phospholipid, naturally occurring phospholipid. That's why whole milk is homogeneous. Okay? Whole milk, no matter how long you wait, the fat does not get separated. So this is why whole milk is so smooth, because it has undergone a process of homogenization. Okay? Now, before they do that, the raw milk does have a layer of cream at the top before then. So when <coughs> we see that layer of cream, you could take that cream off of the surface, because fat always stays at the top, right? Okay. And, okay. and you could agitate it. When you agitate it, when you agitate it, the phospholipid basically, basically breaks, agitated, okay. the fat breaks up, and the phospholipid is going to help, basically, breaks up. You've got, it's going to help, it's going to break up and form back into fat and liquid. That's why buttermilk does not have any fat, no butter fat at all. They say butter fat. Ooh, that's very buttery, high calories. No, because the butter is already out. We made butter out of it, and buttermilk remains. So it's only agitation that we could break up the the membrane, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, why is butter not Oh, during the process is what it is. It, it does, yeah. Uh, it, it is another process. During the process, the fat comes out first. Actually, the fat has a little bit of sourness also. The buttermilk, yes, it, it is sour because it is during the process, almost like it's, it's gone sour, but it has broken up. It doesn't 
it doesn't stay like its original state. But buttermilk itself, that it doesn't have butter, but it's just that it has the butter removed, and then the butter is made from here. And this is why it's a process, and then I'm pretty sure that there is some chemical, some, something there, sourness to help it even get even more sour. Basically, it's gone a somewhat a little bit, but it's not. But it's done under sanitary conditions, so it's still drink. You can drink it. It tastes as if the milk is soured, but it's, it's not. It's fresh milk. But during the process, what is it that they put in? I need to look into that. What is it that they put in to make it even more sour? Or it's just a naturally occurring souring, the, the, the souring process, but some of the bacteria probably produce that sour taste to it. Okay, it's a good question though. Okay, nobody had asked that question before. <laughs> Okay, next. So we know how butter is made. Margarine is made exactly the same way. Try to imitate butter. That's why margarine initially was made into sticks, just like butter. But then because margarine was, remember last time we said it was originally made from what? From vegetable oil. Because if vegetable oil is good for you, why not use vegetable oil as butter, except that it's liquid, it's not solid. In order to make it solid, the chemists were very smart. Remember last time I said? They started adding hydrogen to it to solidify. When they added hydrogen to it, then it becomes solid fat. However, what happened when you add hydrogen to it? What happened to it chemically? For those who have had some chemistry. Um, uh, more hydrogen bonds, but then what is the configuration going to be like? It becomes trans. It doesn't go cis anymore. It goes trans, unfortunately. So it becomes trans fat, and we never knew. Trans fat is trans fat, so what? Solid, it's still, it's, non, it's a non-dairy product. And then when they did more work on it, they said, ah, trans fat is bad. Actually, just as bad as saturated fat or butter or whatever, or even worse. Then, uh, that's why margarine is removed from the market. They don't sell very well. What you see in the grocery stores are all margarine that has been modified. They put different the protein products. They put a variety of different soft, uh, it, it, consistency, consistency has been changed from oil to something that's semi, semi, um, uh, semi liquid or semi solid. What they did is that they put some of the other emulsifying, like some diglyceride. Diglyceride, that means glycer uh, glycerol, dye, two fatty acids, and one hydrogen. And that, because you have a fat, fatty component, you have a, actually a water component. But it's not very artificial. They always use that. It's a very cheap way of doing it. Yeah, it, it, it is an emulsifier, too. It's not as effective, of course, as what we're doing this morning in uh, mayonnaise, you know the real one, but uh, they have a lot of ways to make it look like butter, look like margarine, but it doesn't taste like butter. That's the only thing. So that's margarine. Now they come in tubs because it's semi-solid. That's the only way. So those in sticks, the original margarine is basically no longer there. They said sometimes you could still find it. But if it's in a trans form, why would anybody want to buy it? So they took it off market, basically. So we've done a lot of research. The chemists, food chemists, have done a lot of research in making something that's healthy for you and yet tastes like original butter. But it's almost like in, in, in impossibility. And uh, so, um, you know, all of the um, shortenings that we use, you think shortenings would be good because it's semi-solid, it's almost like butter. But it's not good. Shortening is, again, it's the same thing. It's vegetable oil that has been hydrogenated. The hydrogenated fat is not good because, oh, I'm ahead. Sorry. Let me see. Ah, storage. I'm sorry. No wonder you're looking at them thinking. It's uh, not on the right page. That's 
Okay, I'll just read this. Okay. Let me take a look. Uh, it's out of sequence. Okay, it's out of sequence. So, um, but anyway, storage of fat. So, shortenings coming up, okay, uh, is basically trans fat also. It's vegetable oil that has been uh, chemically transformed to a half, solid, half solidified oil. So it's not good for them. And that's why a lot of French fries and all that, they purposely use shortening. Shortening are great for deep fat frying. Why is shortening so good for deep fat frying? Do you know? Why do we, that, why do we use shortening for French fries? Or deep fat fry anything. We use, we don't use butter, huh? Do you have a high, um, smoke point? It's good. Hey, that's high smoke point. You could take it to very high temperature, and you could deep fat fry, and it tastes good, and doesn't go bad. So it could withstand very high temperature, and that's why deep fat fried French fries, for example, it's wonderful when it's when it's deep fat fried in shortening. Okay. Now, they're all trans fat now. Shortening is basically originally all trans fat. So nowadays, they've come up with something quasi, not shortening per se, but it doesn't have trans fat because did you know McDonald's no longer use shortening for their, for their french fries? Have you tasted McDonald's french fries now? Does it taste good? No, never the same. Not crispy anymore. Not the same. But they've done away with with trans fat, and they advertise it worldwide. Yes. So if you have a crispy fry somewhere, your fry is trans fat. Well, most likely. Yeah. Most likely, unless if it's a particular way that they've done, because you've taken it to very high temperature, and it's really good. There's nothing like the McDonald's French fries everybody said, especially if they were very nice and thin. Okay, that's what they sold more French fries. French fries were more expensive than, than the hamburger itself. That's how they lure you into buying hamburger. Okay. And now, taste the French fries. They live not the same. But anyway, if, you, if there's a food chemist that could develop a product, that's just as good as shortening, and yet not harmful to us, such as trans fat. He could make a lot, or she could make a lot of money. That company will make a lot of money. Right now, we don't have a, a margarine product for, that looks and acts just like butter. Now we can only buy the margarine that's in the tub because they're soft, and they don't act like butter. You cannot shape it into butter. So originally, the, the margarine that was shaped into butter, like imperial margarine, gone. Because they were trans fat, nobody wanted it anymore. So everything, all of the margarine right now, are only in the tub form, they add other products. Glycerol and some protein and some different products to make it not just look, but taste like butter, which is very difficult. Nothing tastes just like butter. So sometimes, why not? We might as well just take butter. But just don't use too much butter. It tastes so much better. And if trans fat is just as bad, or even worse, why take trans fat, right? Unless if you take margarine, that's in the tub form. They tell you no trans fat, but it's very soft. They just put coloring and all that in it. A whole, take a look at the label. A whole bunch of all the chemicals that they put in there. What do we want? So, um, okay, so we were talking about, this is a slide, right? Storage. Butter and margarine, best stored in the refrigerator. Of course, you know that, okay? Shortening, and most oils could be kept at room temperature. And they should be kept tightly covered in, it's best for them not to be exposed to light too much. Light, as you know, makes a lot of changes, chemical changes, um, if you keep them for a long time. So if you keep them in the refrigerator, they, they, they taste a lot better. Basically, butter, margarine, and shortening 
I put them on. And oil, if you could afford the space, put them in the refrigerator, it would be good. They last longer. Now, olive oil has a different thing, different um, character, and a different, different way of storing it. Because the problem with olive oil is that you could, the best way, of course, is to put it in the refrigerator, and I always do that. But they have a shorter shelf life. If you were to keep it at room temperature, they're going to go rancid very easily. So I put them in the refrigerator. The only thing, so what's, what's the problem when you take the olive oil out of the refrigerator? Hmm? Did you notice anything? Olive oil? If you take olive oil out of the refrigerator, can you see anything different? No? Same. Same, but anybody else notice anything? Keep it for us. It gets crystallized. Did you notice that? Because of monounsaturated, okay? So you see those crystals, okay? And it doesn't look good. So when it gets crystallized, that means it gets opaque a little bit. All you have to do is leave it at room temperature for a little while, right? Leave it at room temperature, then it's going to clear. Just use it that way. But it is much better to keep, keep it at refrigerated temperature. Why is that? Because you can store it longer. Store it much longer. So all oils, I usually, even if they small bottle anyway, put them in the refrigerator, especially olive oil. Yeah, it gets cloudy. But when you use it, when you cook it, cook with it, it doesn't matter if it's crystallized. If you're going to be using it for salad dressing, just allow it to stand for a little while. It would clear. Okay? Any questions? It does crystallize because it's monounsaturated. That's why. But that, it's only one saturation. So it's, it's still very good for you, remember? Olive oil. Okay? Whichever way it is. But if you want to have it last longer, keep it in the refrigerator. Okay, let's see. Storage of fat. I talked about that briefly. Uh, rancidity, the chemical deterioration of fat is rancidity. See, the triglyceride, which is the glycerol with three fatty acids, is called the triglyceride. That's fat. So when you have your health exam and blood test done, they always take your cholesterol level in the blood. They also take your triglyceride level. Triglyceride is fat. Okay. How much of the triglyceride do you have in the system? It's the glycerol with three fatty acids. Okay. And um, when you store fat at room temperature for too long, not put it in the refrigerator, it's going to go rancid, such as a lot of oil. It'll go rancid. It's going to go bad because basically the glycerol is going to be taken apart. Okay. It's going to be separated or broken up from the fatty acids. So they all are broken into smaller branches, smaller units, and some of them give very bad off flavor, off odors. So it is better that we put it in the refrigerator. And what kind of food uh, would have a lot of fat, would have a lot of oil, rather? Nuts. A good. Who's saying that? OK, good. So what do you do with nuts? Hmm? Refrigerate it. Very expensive to buy nuts. I've seen so many people serving nuts that have not been refrigerated. They just get thrown away. Put them in the refrigerator. If you want them to last long, put them in the freezer. Even better. They last for a year, two years, three years. Even better. So that this rancidity does not occur. As I said, I mentioned uh, before that one time I was in the vestibule a while ago, and I told one, one of my students, I said, can you tell the chef? not to use these nuts anymore. They are rancid. And the student said, what? Dr. Sim, what did you say? I said, these nuts are rancid. What? What did you say? They are bad. Oh, 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 yes, yes, yes. I'll tell the chef. Rancidity is a, a word for fat going bad. Okay? A lot of this course is all vocabulary. You'll see that after you've taken this course, you could converse with anybody uh, more intelligently, discuss about health aspects of what is good for you, not good for you, what tastes good, what it doesn't taste good. It's all based on 
a little bit of chemistry, a little bit of biology, a little bit of, uh, you know, food preparation, a little bit of everything. But we don't expect you to have basically any chemistry or advanced chemistry background. Okay, so now I'm done with this. I am going to uh, go on to the next topic. Starch sauces and soups. Okay, I think today I should have enough time to finish up. So I'm finally caught up from one missing class, which was the Labor Day holiday. I've never been able to catch up until I think today I'll be. I'll be just on time. Okay, we talked about glucose, we talked about starches. Glucose, we said, is only one molecule, one unit. That's all that it is, such as glucose or fructose. But chemically, they're slightly different, but it's only one unit, one molecule. Starch is different. Starch is not sweet. When many of these glucose join hands, they're no longer sweet. It's a long chain holding hand with another molecule, long, long chain. It's called starch. Okay, so next, now that we know the difference between glucose and starch, which we've already covered before, let's talk about starch in cooking. And that's what we're going to be doing next week. Next week, we'll be cooking, uh, using starch in cooking. And we already talked about these complex carbohydrates. How do we get the complex carbohydrates? Where do we get them from? Where do we get, where do we get the carbohydrate complex? Carbohydrates such as starch. Where do we get the starches? Plants, yeah. Where do the, yeah. How did the plants get them? From photosynthesis. And they need several essential gases. Where do they get the essential gases? The essential gas from us. What do we breathe out? Carbon dioxide, which they love. Whatever we don't want, they love. They need that for photosynthesis. Now, one thing I didn't get a chance to tell you is that plants also do regular breathing like we do at night. At night, they breathe like we do. They take in oxygen, they give out carbon dioxide only at night. But if you keep plants at night in the darkness, the plant is not gonna make food, the plant is gonna die. They have to make food. If they make food, they have to make food under sunlight, which is called photosynthesis during nighttime. So you have to take the plant from darkness to the light, and they will make food during daytime because they know that we need what? What kind of gas do we need? Oxygen. So it is an amazing world, and people who are religious will say, don't tell me that there's no God. <laughs> All right, next. Is, um, so what do they make during photosynthesis? What do we need from them, from plant? When we eat corn, we love corn, we could, the manufacturing companies also love corn, they could make cornstarch. Wheat, we need wheat because they're gonna get the wheat kernels, not the wheat kernels, and get the flour from wheat to give us carbohydrate. Same thing with rice, rice kernel, same thing. And also root starches, what are the root starches? What else, what other food do they make? Root starches, what do we eat that are roots the plant make? Turnip, carrots, what else? Beets, oh yeah, a lot. Carrots, 
These are all root starches. All of them are starches, okay? These starches function as thickening agent in our cooking. So they're great for us to make different sauces, different soups, and different dishes because they could achieve the viscosity. Viscosity, they could achieve the thickness in the final dishes that makes the food much more palatable for us. Okay, now we talk about gelatinization. What is gelatinization by definition? By definition, gelatinization is a reaction of starch kernels, starch from starch kernels. When it's refined, they become starch kernels, small grains, small particles of starches. Okay. There's a reaction. If you put it in water, there's a reaction going on, and also in heat. First of all, you have to put it in water first to dissolve the starches. Next, you apply heat to it, and then gelatinization is going to occur. So the cooking process of these starch granules with water under heat is gelatinization. See what it is that these starch kernels or these particles absorb the water and they swell up. When they swell up, they increase in viscosity. That means they get thicker and thicker. And this is what I, we like in cooking. And this particular process actually happens below 100, 100 degree centigrade, which is to 12 degrees Fahrenheit. It happens below boiling, it already happens. It starts to get thickened. It starts to increase its viscosity. So swelling um, occurs okay, at an early stage when it starts getting warm warmer, warmer until it's hot, and it, it gets gelatinized. And it reaches a maximum point. Remember, it would only reach a maximum point of gelatinization. Okay. When it reaches a maximum size or maximum gelatinization, okay, you should take it off of the flame. This is it. You should not overcook it. Because what it is, is that if you continue to, you see what it is that these granules get larger and larger, small, larger, and larger, and larger. And it, it has a maximum point upon which it will stay larger. It will eventually break, is what I'm saying, if you overcook it. So the maximum, we're always wondering what is the maximum size, maximum size that we could actually allow it to grow in size. So it does reach a maximum level or maximum size beyond which it's going to implode. Implode is what? It's going to break. It's going to break. It's going to rupture. When it ruptures, it's going to rupture in. When it ruptures in, then the starch granules will become, then, then your result will get very pasty. So if I have a gravy on whatever it is, biscuit or on even prime rib of beef, if the gravy is not made well, you could taste it. Or if it's a cream soup that's not made well, you could taste it. It's pasty, overcooked, pasty. It's already gone beyond that maximum point. So make sure it does not get to that stage. Okay. So when these granules collapse, basically the water is going and everything's going to erupt. The starches will come out and it tastes like something. You, you would know when you taste it. It's not the best possible product. So when you make a white sauce, we make it, we make it in a double boiler, I have to be very careful. Sometimes I would have a friend asking me, well, Jana, could I help you? Uh, why you're so busy doing something else. I'll help you with a white sauce, which is fine. Okay. Then she starts mixing. All you have to do is just stand there and mix, mix, so you don't want it to burn, the white sauce. Okay. But then she's, there she is. 
She keeps saying, and I am, if I'm busy doing anything else, or doing the dessert, doing something, I had forgotten about my friend who's, who's stirring my, my product, my white sauce. So you better either set the timer or remember to go and check on her. So the next time when you go back, you take a look at the product, the, oh, it's already pasty, it's already broken. You would know. It's not the same consistency. You have to start all over again. There's no rescue whatsoever, okay? Because implosion occurs if it goes beyond that point. You only could take it to the maximum point. Okay, now dry uh, principles of starch cooking. Dry starch granules have the tendency to pack together, like cornstarch. So every once in a while, you know, all-purpose flour, not so much, but some of the other starches would, would have the tendency to pack together, and especially in humid weather. So to gelatinize starch, you know, when you start to cook, something with flour or with the starch granules, first of all, you need to separate the starch granules with something. You have to separate them because they have the tendency to clump together. So what is the best medium to use when you want them to be separated so they don't, they don't clump on you? You want the gravy to be nice and smooth. So what would you use? Anybody's made gravy? Mm? Yeah, whisk. Uh, what, what is the food product you put in to make sure that they get separated before you cook? Oh, fat. Okay. Yeah, turkey fat is okay. Or butter. You could use butter to break it up. Fat of some kind. Turkey fat is another. Or if you're doing roast beef, or ro roast beef fat. If you're not conscious of it, you're not worried about the fat, <laughs> animal fat, per perfectly okay, very delicious, okay. Or you separate with another liquid. So these are the two possibilities. You could separate the granules before you even introduce heat to it, okay? Then, because otherwise you're gonna get into trouble because they do have the tendency to clump. All right, and then now you apply, you've added the water, liquid or fat. Now, and after you added the liquid or the fat, <coughs> Now, the chicken fat, did you say? Or turkey fat? Turkey fat, I do the same thing. Thanksgiving's coming up. Think about what menu to have. Okay, with the turkey, you have to have a nice gravy with the turkey. I'll tell you about how to make turkey the best way, okay? It'll be on, the, I hope, I have a timed in such a way it's gonna be right before, before Thanksgiving. You report to me how your turkey turned out. <laughs> but anyway, <laughs> but with the turkey gravy, you've got to have a good turkey gravy to go with it, okay? You want the meat to be, turkey meat to be nice and moist. You want, the, you, you want the gravy to be nice and smooth and not clumped together. Okay, so you, you've separated with fat. Okay. And then now you add, uh, what do you add? You add flour to your, to your gravy. Flour is typical starch to add to gravy. So you add um, starch to that, okay, to the fat, and now we add the liquid. The liquid could be the turkey uh, broth. I make a, a nice broth because all the bones, you know, parts of the leg or parts of the wings that you don't want, any part, the neck, whatever you don't want, I make a nice uh, uh, a broth under low heat. We'll talk about that stock, basically. And they, so you add that flavored stock. If it's not enough, you add a can of chicken broth because you can't find turkey broth. It's very good gravy. Okay, but you have to constantly stir while you're applying the heat, while you're introducing that. So make sure the starch granules are equally distributed to the water and heat. So each time, that's the principle of starch cooking. Okay. You have to separate the starch granules with either fat or liquid. You add the liquid, you apply heat, and constantly stirring using what? What's the best utensil to use? 
Yeah. And then uh, apply motion until it's evenly distributed, and that's the best way. Okay, next is starch mixing method. There are altogether basically three different ways of mixing starches. Typically, the first one is the Roux method, R-O-U-X. How many know what the Roux method is? Nobody? The Roux method? Oh, yeah, sure. How do you use the Roux method? What do you start? Uh, flour and butter first, right? You melt, what do you use? You use the melted butter, or melt, you melt the fat, and then you add the flour, which is a starch, to it. Okay, so you produce now a paste. Now, the fat is used to what? to separate the starch granules, okay? You have to use the fat to separate the starch granules, otherwise it's gonna clump, okay? So this particular mixture, fat with the starch is called the what? It's called the roux. You have to know that word. It's called the roux. The chefs have a whole bunch of roux made, and we'll talk about the rest later. So this flour thickened so, and then they add, eventually, they add the liquid to it. Whether it's chicken stock they put in, or beef stock they put in, now they hydrate it. So now they've made sauces, chicken gravy, or beef gravy, and now you can serve the beef with the gravy on top. Okay, so that's the roux method. Roux method is melted fat and starch. The next method is the slurry method. The slurry method is when you use cold water to it. So you mix the starch with cold water. Do you know of any product that you use cold water to it? Any starch that requires cold water, not fat? Cornstarch. Cornstarch typically is used in Asian soups, such as egg drop soup. We will do that in the lab next week. Cornstarch with cold water. Mix that together, and then you put it into the boiling soup. A little bit at a time, you see it thicken, thicken, thicken more. It's an easy way. So it's very easy to separate with just water. You don't need fat with cornstarch. The third way of doing it is a dry method. Dry method is when starch is mixed with another dry ingredient to separate these starch granules. Okay, so starch could use maybe sugar to separate it, because you have to separate. If you don't separate them, they get clumpy, starchy, and pasty. Okay, before you add the hot liquid, such as vanilla pudding or chocolate pudding, uh, chocolate pudding, you have cornstarch with chocolate powder and sugar. Make sure you mix them in to separate them, and then you add liquid. So those are the three methods. The first one, the roux method, which is starch with melted fat. The second one is starch with cold water, such as Asian soup. The third method is dry method, starch with another dry ingredient or ingredients. Make sure they get separated first. Now you could add the hot liquid and whatever, it won't clump. It won't get pasty and clump, clumpy. Okay, so these are the three basic methods I'm sure I'm gonna ask you. And we will be doing it in the lab. Did I have a, okay. Ooh, it's a thickening. I think I'm still missing one, let me see. Okay, um, so let's go back to the roux method. The roux method, remember, is just what? What is the roux method? What is a thickening agent, generally speaking? Thickening agent is all-purpose flour. We use all-purpose flour to thicken. And what kind of, what do we use to separate all 
all-purpose flour granules. Fat, good. So what is the ratio? How much fat do you use? The ratio is one-to-one -one ratio, fat and flour. That's what it is. So that's the basis for making gravy, whether it's beef gravy or chicken gravy, turkey gravy, whatever it is. The seasoning itself will come from the stock, from the liquid. We talk about stock, how you make stock to make the gravy taste good. So it tastes just like it's coming from the bird or from the beef or whatever. Now you blend them well and you cook over low heat to form a paste. When you cook it, keep stirring it, make sure they separate the starch granules. And the fat will coat the granules. When, they, when the fat coats the granules, it prevents clumping to occur. So it does not clump anymore. You don't have to worry about being pasty or lumpy, lumpy. Now you add liquid and heat to gelatinize. You cannot go wrong. You have a very nice smooth gravy, and we'll see it in the meal lab. Okay, there are lots of fats and liquids that can be used depending on the flavor, which I already mentioned. If you're serving with chicken, make sure you use chicken stock. If you're serving with beef, make sure you have beef stock and not use chicken stock. Very important. So they have to be compatible. Uses of uh, roux. Okay, when we say bechamel sauce, which is a French word originally, you know, the French are known to make the best white sauce. When you go to France, you go to Paris, my goodness, their sauces are wonderful, but also rich. <laughs> uh, so bechamel sauce, that's why the word itself is white sauce, means it's French word, it's a French sauce. They make the best uh, white sauce for one cup of milk. On the basis of one cup of milk, thin sauce is basically one tablespoon to of butter to one tablespoon of flour, one to one ratio. That makes cream soup. If I remember correctly, I think for those who are dietetics majors, I think they asked the question about medium sauce. Two to two makes a good so the ratio of two tablespoons of butter to two tablespoons of flour makes the gravy, the gravy. Not soup, but the gravy to serve on top of meat or chicken, whatever you're serving. Thick sauce will be, now this is just approximate, okay? The thick sauce is three tablespoons of butter to three tablespoons of flour to one cup, all based on one cup of flour, uh, one cup of milk, I'm sorry, one cup of milk, three and three, three tablespoons of butter, three tablespoons of flour, so it's a lot thicker. When it's a lot thicker, you could use it for souffle. I'm gonna see if I could have a souffle recipe for you to do souffle next week. And I will have a recipe for you to make a, uh, a cream sauce. <coughs> and I would try to find the recipe for cream soup, any cream soup. If you have any recipes, you could take it to the meal lab. We could test it out for everybody to taste it also. But it's all, these are only approximate because sometimes with cream soup, they put so much, whipped, especially the French, they love uh, dairy products, especially whipped cream, put a lot of cream. If they already are using rich cream, then you don't need all this butter. Okay, so one butter to one tablespoon of flour is the very general guidelines, depending on what kind of milk you use. If you use skim milk, of course it'll be lighter. If you use heavy cream, please don't put, again, too much butter in it. It'll be too rich. Okay, so this is just approximate guideline for it. Okay. Or you can make, what time is it? Uh, three to three. Okay, we happen to four. Okay. I, said, uh, I just get panicked. Sometimes I go talk and talk, I get panicked. Oh, time is up now. Okay, so um, very thick sauce will be four and four. Four tablespoons of butter, four tablespoons of flour for every one cup of 
milk used. Then it's even thicker. It's just almost like pasty, very thick. When it's so thick, you could easily use that as a binder, such as when you use croquettes. Chicken croquettes, turkey croquettes, uh, corn croquettes, all kinds, deep fat fried. Okay. Is, what kind of binder do they use? That's what it is. The sauce, the white sauce is a binder, but it's just very thick. It's four, four to one cup. So if it's turkey croquettes, leftover turkey from turkey Thanksgiving time, put turkey in there, and then they roll it in uh, uh, breadcrumbs, and then uh, you can deep fat fry, whatever. It tastes very good. Okay. Uh, so those, one, two, three, four, those are the four sauces to use for different food products. Very typical. You ought to know that. But it's only approximate now. Take a look at the recipe. If they already have very rich creamed milk or half and half, okay, this is only based on one cup of milk, whole milk, or even even two percent milk will be just fine. We're just eating too much fat sometimes, so you need to make the adjustment for that. Okay. Velute sauce. You need to know velute sauce. Velute sauce. It's basically the same. The only thing is that instead of using milk, you use white stock or fish stock, <coughs> which fish soup or, or a white colored soup is what it is. Soup base has to be clear. We'll talk about stock in just a little while, how to make stock. But don't use milk. Okay. Velouté sauce is wonderful when you serve it on fish and light um, gravy, um, maybe on fish, on a lot of products, so you don't want the white color to appear. Okay? So the last kind is a brown sauce. The brown sauce, uh, also, by the way, I forgot, uh, velouté sauce will be, will be great for turkey gravy, too. Turkey gravy. You don't want a white sauce. You want a turkey sauce. Okay? Uh, uh, Espanol or Brown sauce is super for what? Brown sauce to be served on what? On meats, all kinds of meats, beef especially, okay? You have to have a brown sauce. And uh, so instead of using milk, what do you use? You use what? Brown stock. And how do we make brown stock? We'll talk about that in just a little at the last slide. We'll talk about how to make stock, okay? So the color is brown, the taste is meaty and it works perfect to be served when you serve it on meat, roast beef. All right, any questions? Ah, coming up, I didn't realize it's coming up so soon. Let me see. No, something's wrong. Ah, something's wrong. Did I skip? I know, but uh, that's supposed to come late. I don't know why. Let me see. Oh, I'll, I'll just go ahead and make that. It's just as good to have this slide first because I just finished talking about stock. We might as well, we might, might as well learn about how about how about my uh, uh, PowerPoint presentation online. Oh yeah, actually, this one. Hey, this one. Okay, all right, so I can talk about stocks, right? No. Okay, which is good. Actually, this is a good sequence anyway. So we just talked about ma making the bechamel sauce or the white sauce using milk. And for meat, you ought to use stock. What is a stock? A stock is a flavored, clear liquid. Clear, not murky, not cloudy, with no thickening agent. A stock is just very clear. Actually, the Asians do really good job with making stock for soup. You go to a Chinese restaurant, Vietnamese restaurant, they clear their stock, their soup is so clear, so tasty, and they use it for, for soups, for basically for soups. Cannot be cloudy. It's the same thing with the Western stock. It's the same. Methodology is such. Use a large pot. You start with cold water. You add all kinds of bones, cracked bones, water, and you can add neck bones, whatever bones you have, okay? But do not boil. Key thing. 
to remember, do not boil. If you boil, it gets emulsified, it's ruined. Because, you know, if you're throwing a lot of bones and pieces of sinews and gelatin and all that, it all gets gelatinized. Ooh, you cannot use that stock anymore. You want it to be clear. This is where the Asians are really good at making a good, clear stock, and yet so flavorful. Okay, so white stock, if you want to make white stock, you put chicken bones in it or veal bones in it. If you make white, a brown stock, you want a deeper color. You want a brown color. So you can brown the bones, you can brown the meat to give it a more deep, give a, a much deeper color than what you normally would have and before you add it in. So if you brown it, it's going to give you more of a darker color. Then you put it in. Okay. And then you're putting vegetables. Putting vegetables later, not too early. Because otherwise, if you put it too early, it's going to break it apart, gets fragmented, and you can't get it out again. It's all going to get emulsified. So put that in. To be, and vegetables are very good because it adds flavor. Yes? Very no, I tell you why. Once you, <laughs> Lauren said no. You must be a good cook. Okay, <laughs> I tell you. I tell you a little bit more. Ask the same question again. Okay, uh, so you're putting large pieces of vegetables just by making mayonnaise. Be very careful. Once it breaks, it breaks. But it's a good example for people to see. Which I think half of the class made good mayonnaise. The other half didn't. They, they, they did a really good job. Everybody did a really good job. It's just that it's easy to to have it broken, so don't worry about it, okay? It's a learning process. Why should we not do next time? Okay, uh, so you, now, most important thing, make sure you simmer, <coughs> cannot boil it. Now, I don't know the chefs here in the visit room because before when I worked uh, in the visit room before, uh, I was the one who hired Chef Dan, and he was a super, super chef. Every day he had a pot. All right, yay big, making the stock. His stock was very flavorful. That's exactly what he did. Because large, to be added, let me see. Then you simmer. It can never boil. Once you boil, it gets cloudy, okay? Simmer rather than boil, why? Why would boiling turn it cloudy? Very, very important. Once it turns cloudy, <laughs> Who asked me the question? You cannot reverse it. Okay, yeah. So make sure it's at very low temperature. That's why you have to boil for such a long time. At, not boil, heat it rather. Simmer, even below simmer. Because you know why? There are all kinds of things in the animal body. Okay. Gelatin and uh, the bones have all kinds of bone marrow and all that. And once you boil that, it all gets emulsified, some of the protein product. Once it gets emulsified, it gets cloudy. Once the soup, the stock gets cloudy, mm -mm, you cannot use it anymore. So you really have to be a good chef to do that. Okay. You simmer rather than boil. Why? Very important. Do not turn. Yeah. It's still nutritious though, right? It's not like oh, oh, that's right. But you, you're eating more fat. The fat gets emulsified in. I, I'm conscious about that. And a good chef would skim off all of the fat at the top. You're not going to get any fat. It's all nice, true flavor. Good question. Any, anybody else? No? I thought somebody else had a question. Yeah. So that's the reason. You don't want you. You see, in the, in the animal body, there are all kinds of stuff that could emulsify it especially protein. Protein could, be, could have positive and negative signs on both. Once it gets in, it could allow it to get emulsified. So now, once it's done after you simmer it for a long time, the flavor is good. Now you could put salt in it to it if you want, okay? Remove all the impurities, remove the bones, the food particles, and all the impurities. So it's all very clear. The French chefs are so good at making that. And that's whenever the chef first goes in, that's the first thing they do, stock. A lot of Asian restaurants too. First thing, a good chef makes a good stock no matter what. 
okay, remove the impurities, and then now what you do, the French chefs is what they do, they do so well. They now reduce the stock all the way from here, all the way down, all the way down. They could bring it to one eighth of the volume or even one twentieth of the volume. And Chef Dan used to put it, put them in different containers, okay, and he would freeze it, you could even freeze it. And so whenever he had to make a gravy, you think he could make a quick gravy quickly with his own flavoring? All he has to do is go and spoon a little bit of that. So flavorful, so tasty with all the vegetables and meat. Make the gravy. Here it is. Okay. Uh, or if he has to make a soup, even tomato soup. You need tomato soup, even the best tomato soup. You know, once you have a scoop of the stock to make tomato soup, corn soup, any soup. He doesn't have to use the very, very concentrated. They are all reduced to different levels and the French have certain uh, demi will be half, okay, smaller and smaller. The, the, the less it is, the more concentrated it is, the better it is for gravy. The less concentrated you could use it for soups. Okay. And this is the secret of the best French cuisine. Okay, any question? Okay. Okay, now we're talking about the laws of thickening property. Now, sometimes you have an acid product. If you're putting lemon juice or something acid, you'll break up the consistency of the product hydrolysis is going to occur, that means it's going to get thinner, okay? And sometimes when you are whipping the product and you put too much mechanical manipulation to it, you over stir, you over whip it, okay, it could get to the point of breaking it. That means the maximum thickening stage has gone over just like mayonnaise. You could go beyond that. Then it becomes thinner. Or sometimes you heat it, you overheat it, and heat it again, and heat it again, then you lose the thickening pro property. So these are the three conditions that could easily lose the thickening property because a sauce should be nice and thick. A nice soup should have the body not thick, should have the body. Anything should have a body. The body actually starts with that product, which is a stock, flavorful, and it gives you the body. Anything with uh, the French cuisine, it has to have a nice body, and that comes from a good stock, and also the process, okay? So if you put too much acid to it, be very careful. If you overheat it, be very careful. If you over manipulate it, be very careful. They can break. All right. Okay. Now, dextrinization is just the name that applies to the, br uh, the browning process of starch. Sometimes you say, well, all purpose flour is white. I don't want a white product. I want a brown gravy. I want a brown product. So you could brown the starch if you want. You could brown it <clears throat> in the frying pan without oil, just plain. Don't put oil to it, okay? Just plain, overheat, and you see the starch browning. And now the starch could be used to make brown gravy for a change. It's not white flour. You could do that. However, when you break the starch to smaller molecules, it's going to get a little sweeter because you're going to break it up to dextrins, smaller units, in dry heat, in dry heat. So you can do that. Sometimes it gives you a nice, sweeter product, but it's not, it's going to break it up, so it's not going to be as thick either, okay? So you've got a reduction of thickening power. So you may have to brown a little more of the flour to increase the thickening uh, power. And uh, so sometimes, uh, you could add the unbrowned starch to get the desired thickness because the browned, remember, 
browning, re browning process will break it up into smaller particles. It's not going to be as thick. So you could combine, you say, oh, it's not going to be thick. What do I do? So you could add some regular flour to it to thicken it back if you want. So you can play with it if you want. Okay, same thing with mayonnaise. Once it's broken, it's broken. However, you can get it back by starting the process all over again. Okay, and add the broken mayonnaise drop by drop again into the egg yolk and uh, whatever you're using. So there's always, but it's just a, it's a, it's a nuisance to have to do it again. Today we didn't do it, even though a couple of them were. Oh, sorry. Bourmonet thickening agent. And this is what the French cooks do. And this is what good cooks always do to thicken. Sometimes the gravy doesn't quite get thick the way because it's easy. You measure it wrong. You've got too much liquid. You have less flour and less butter, right? You never know when, you, when you're anxious to get the product. Don't have to worry. You could always add a little bit of the thickening agent, which is the bourmonet. What it is is that I saw the chef used to have butter and flour. He used to knead equal parts of butter and flour and put them in balls and keep them in the refrigerator. So when the gravy is not quite as thick, he would drop one. Stir, whisk it together. I learned a lot from the chef, okay? Oh, it's still not quite thick. You drop another one. Mm, it looks better. Maybe another ball. Perfect. So these pea-sized balls are whisked into the simmering process. And you could do this until you get the desired thickness. These are all tricks the chefs use to give you the best thickening agent. It's a, it's a very quick thickening agent. At the very end, you could do that to give you the right uh, thickness. So, you know, you know the name, Bourmonet. The chefs, the French chefs do the same thing. I saw our chef doing the same thing. Okay, this is very easy. This is the Asian soup. Asians like to use cornstarch to thicken. The starch is not the same as wheat starch. It's not thick, it's light very popular in Asian cuisine. Basically, you put equal amount of cornstarch and cold water together, mix it together. I usually mix um, quite a bit more than I expected. So I will mix, stir it together until the starch is evenly distributed. And then you make sure that, you make sure the hot liquid is very hot. The soup is very hot, but yet the soup it doesn't have body, too thin. You can't drink it, you want it thicker. So now you've got this, in this hand, cornstarch and cold water. You've got the soup right here. You keep stirring while it's hot, okay? And you pour this into the hot soup until you get the right consistency. So the gelatinization occurs almost right away. Very easy to do. And you do that in a lab also, in addition making a medium uh, sauce. Uh, one unit of cornstarch thickens twice as much liquid as one unit of flour, but it's less stable as the roux. Roux is much more stable than the cornstarch. So they, all the different starch granules act differently. So after a while, the cornstarch is not going to stand in, you know, in the same consistency, and you see it when you come back. It has already thinned up quite a bit, but that's the way cornstarch is. <coughs> Whereas a gravy made with uh, all-purpose flour usually stays in that condition for a while. Holiday sauce, I think we could have that. We have two labs on this because there's so many things we could do. Uh, I would like to have each my philosophies that I have, each student experience the same pretty much the important uh, process of cooking. So uh, with two labs, we could do that. We switch the recipes. So the important recipes are tested or practiced by the same student. So with two labs, we could do it. Well, one lab, we just could only observe to see what they did. 
but you don't get the feel of it until you do it yourself. Okay, hollandaise sauce is difficult to do. Hollandaise sauce is only possible because we use egg yolk. We talked about egg yolk. It's, a, it's the best, the best emulsifier, a naturally occurring emulsifier. We have other emulsifiers. I talked to my class this morning. Other emulsifiers are monoglyceride. Monoglyceride is glycerol with only one fatty acid because one is fatty, the other is still. Uh, one is water soluble, one is fat soluble, but it's not as effective. Uh, when they make candies, when they make, you, you see a lot of monoglyceride or diglyceride. Diglyceride is one glycerol and two fatty acid. It's the same, it's also emulsifier. They use it in the factory a lot as an emulsifier, but it's never the same as the egg yolk. Egg yolk is naturally, um, occurring, it does magic, it does uh, the emulsification process so well. So in the double boiler, we make an emulsified sauce. Double boiler is uh, a pot that's sitting on top of another pot. The hot water at the bottom never touches the bottom of the, the upper pot. Okay, so there's spacing between. So the heat is cut down by a lot. So the heat is very mild, very moderate heat only, because we don't want to overheat it. So in the double boiler, the inside of the top boiler, we put the egg yolk, the hot water, the lemon juice, and vinegar, and we whisk that in with the clarified. What is clarified melted butter? Butter has some solids. We have to remove the solids. So it's all butter fat, butter oil. So we clarify means all the solids are being removed. How many of you go to a seafood restaurant and have lobster? And it says clarified butter. What is clarified butter? Do you see all those solids? No, they already removed it. And this is what it is. It looks so much better. You taste the real butter. Because once the solid is there, you really cannot take the heat up too high. Not only it doesn't look good, okay, it looks a lot better if it's all clarified. And so for an expensive meal, if you're already eating lobster, they give you the best, already clarified. So clarified melted butter, so that all the solids, solid protein, are removed. And then whisk in the melted butter slowly in with <coughs> egg yolk, and the water is in the double boiler, and you see um, that the egg yolk emulsifies the butter with the water and the lemon juice mixture, just like mayonnaise. But it's just that it's on heat, heated uh, uh, double boiler. So it's, the process is pretty much the same. The other is that room temperature, now hollandaise sauce is a cooking process. And what do you do with the hollandaise sauce? It is so delicious, hollandaise sauce. But it's rich, it has butter, egg yolk, uh, what else? Lemon juice, just like uh, mayonnaise, and some seasoning, salt, or whatever. What do you use it on? Regularly, when you go to uh, a nice brunch or or breakfast, you could ask for poached egg. On uh, you could ask for poached egg, and you wanted uh, toast and a slice of uh, bacon, slice of uh, ham on the side, that's a pretty good lunch, pretty good breakfast. But if you ask for, what do you have to ask for? Yeah. If hollandaise sauce, if you have English muffin, same English muffin that you already have on the plate, okay. uh, if you have a slice of uh, ham, you have a poached steak on top, and you put hollandaise sauce over it, you call it Eggs Benedict, you could charge how much? $15 at least. And that's how you make money. So don't serve them separately. This is a specialty item, Eggs Benedict. If you know how to make a good hollandaise sauce, just like you make mayonnaise, and pour that on top, it's absolutely delicious. All right. Okay, sauces. 
When we say a sauce, what do we mean? What is the definition of a sauce? A sauce is a liquid, whether it's milk or stock that you have, plus a thickening agent, which is flour or cornstarch. Okay. Those are the key, two key uh, products, plus seasoning, right? So a sauce, anytime you serve any sauce, a white sauce over your product, fish product, or whether it's a brown sauce over your prime rib of beef, okay, that sauce is very, very special. You take a look at the sauce, you know how they make it, how much time they put into it, and you know how good it is. You know how much money they could demand from you. It should be lump free. If, if it has lumps, what does it mean? You didn't separate the starch particles initially. It has to have a clear flavor. If it's not clear, what does it have in there? A sauce should not be pasty. If it's pasty, we already talked about that. The starch granules have already ruptured. Okay, not pasty, should have clear flavor and not floury. If it's floury, what does it mean? Undercooked. You still smell the flour, taste of flour, undercooked. It has to be properly cooked. It cannot be pasty. If it's pasty, the starch granules are already ruptured. Okay. All right, the consistency. Consistency should be nice and thick. How do you know the gravy is ready? You pick up a spoon, you dip it into the brown gravy, or whatever gravy it is, it should coat the back of the spoon. When it coats it, when it does not slide off of it, it's ready. That's how we could tell, all right? And it will not separate or break when heat is applied, okay? Separate, that means you're already at the point of separation anyway. All you do is if you heat it, it already broke. Wow, you took it too far. Too took it to too far a stage that you almost broke it anyway. Okay. Now, there are other sauces that does not matter. You could put it together any way you want, such as tomato sauce. Conglomeration of everything you put in. It could still taste good, but it's not the classic sauces. We, I already mentioned about all the classic sauces that you should know. Okay. So sometimes when you have a mixture of egg yolk and heavy cream that gives you this velvety texture, a rich sauce. See, some, to me, if I were to have a cream soup that's too rich, to me, it's, it's got too many calories. You put too much heavy cream to it. Often this, that's what they do to give that heavy cream uh, flavor. And sometimes it's so rich that you could only digest so much, you cannot even tolerate it. But some people can take it, which is why it gives a very velvety texture. If you put a little bit in it, it will be okay. Depends on how far you want to go. Tomato sauce. Tomato sauce could be beef, chicken stock, chopped with all kinds of things. Chopped onion, tomato puree, tomato paste, tomatoes, ground beef, everything. Be grateful for spaghetti sauce on pasta. Very easy to make. Anybody, no, no special talent whatsoever. Okay. Sometimes you see beurre blanc or rouge with blanc. Blanc is what French word for blanc is, means what? White. White sauce. What's rouge? Red sauce. So it'd be white sauce, or they put down the French word name because the French would. The French are well known worldwide for making the best sauces in the world. They pride themselves with the French cuisine. Has the best cuisine in the world. Okay. Actually, the next is supposed to be Italian. So, uh, beurre blanc would be white butter or red butter. It would be butter sauce is what it is. Made without eggs, okay, but made with red wine or, or butter. So, Sometimes if you are drinking Merlot, 
it's a good idea to put a little bit of the Merlot into the brown sauce that you're serving on prime rib or steak, whatever beef that you're serving, because they complement each other. Don't mix up the wine too much. It's the best, this is what they say, because you could, you, you could taste from one, from wine, mm, you get to taste a little bit of again in the sauce. So don't use another wine. Try to use the same wine that you're serving. Merlot or what? What else is a Sauvignon Blanc, any of these, or Cabernet Sauvignon, or any red wine to be added to the red sauce or red gravy gives that extra umph to it and extra dollars you could dem demand from the guests, from the customers. It's a wine sauce. Basically, it all depends on what kind of wine they put in. But the same sauce is still the same sauce. They make a good sauce anyway. Add a little bit of the wine that goes with the meal. So if it's red meats, put in red wine because you serve with the brown gravy anyway. But if it's fish or chicken, you put in some white wine with it, if you want. Okay, make that very special. Okay. Pan gravy. Pan gravy is what we talked about earlier. Uh, instead of using butter, you could use turkey fat or chicken fat. Things that I don't like too much fat in the gravy. So I just, when I roast turkey for Thanksgiving, I still use a little, b little bit of the turkey uh, fat because if not, it's not the same taste. I use the pan gravy, but I pour away a lot of the extra, gravy, extra fat that I don't need. So it's made directly in the pan. So what I, you could always pour away excess fat. Otherwise, it's too much fat. Nowadays, nowadays they raise all the uh, chickens and turkeys uh, to, to such heavy weights and so much fat in them. After you roast it, you've got so much fat, you've got to pour some away. Okay, otherwise it tastes too fatty anyway, and it, it, it's, not, it's not tasty anyway. So I would pour away some of the fat, okay, and I would make the gravy directly into the pan. You still have some drippings, a little bit of the brown, brown drippings that we add flavor. Okay, so you use the drippings from the roast, and you thicken the liquid that's there and the fat thickens the, the fat that's there with what? How do you make a brown gravy? How do you make a gravy for turkey? I got the drippings there. I pour away the excess fat. Now what do I put in? Flour. Yeah, use flour. Okay. Whip the flour in. Mix it in. Okay. After the flour is in, I want to make sure I still have time. Let me know if I don't have time. Then, uh, so you whip the the flour in, and then what do you add to it to add flavor? Hmm? Stock. stock, good. You can make your own stock. I always make my own stock when I, when I roast my turkey for Thanksgiving because you've got all the extra pieces. You've got the giblets, you've got the, the, the neck and all that. So I just keep that, and I make the stock, okay? So the stock is very flavorful, and I put the stock in there to make the turkey gravy. And if you don't have enough, you could always add a can of chicken broth. Secret to that. Chicken broth is closest to turkey. Still complements it pretty well. So, uh, so it, gives it, it gives it a really nice flavor. Okay, so you added the, you added the flour, you add the stock, you make sure you, you, you mix it very well with a wire whip, and now you thicken it, now you've got a very nice, uh, uh, you've got the flour, and you got the stock, and now you have a very nice gravy, okay? And uh, so I have one that's coolest. Coolest is just a sauce made from a puree. Sometimes you could use pureed vegetables and pureed fruit, like uh, a dessert with pureed fruit is very good to serve pureed fruit on. So you could also make a nice sauce from just fruit itself or vegetables itself. Okay, and now I, okay, I wanted to talk about stock. That's what it is. I put an extra slide there, so that when I was talking about stock, I already mentioned this, so 
it's already, I think everything's covered. Let me see. At the end, uh, remove the, the bones, the food particles, and reduce the stock to glassy. Glassy is French. It's uh, basically the essence of the real uh, stuff from stock. And you could reduce it to half, half demi or full uh, whatever. And then you keep it. That's what chefs do. They keep it in the, in the freezer or in the refrigerator. Whenever they make soups and sauces, you could be the best chef. But the, the soups are not good. If the sauces are not good, mm, ruin it. Yeah. So when you reduce the stock so much, when you make a soup, you need to pour a bunch of water back in? No, no. You want it to be nice and concentrated oh. when you reduce it. Because there's nothing else. It's all clear broth. You could do that. Slowly, slowly reduce it. So that pot, for a good chef, that star pot is always, always on the stove. Because when that's done, you start another, another round. Okay. So he's got just chunks. You can just pick up. You just pick up something for soup. It'll make the more constant. Oh no, for 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 gravies, s sauces, you'll get more and more concentrated, more concentrated. So for soups, you'll get the less concentrated. But whatever it is, that's what gives the real body. So s all soups have to body. It doesn't mean that for body you have to have cornstarch or, or flour. No, the body, the the real body should come from the stock itself. And then you know whether he's a, he or she is a real good, real chef or not. Oh, okay, I just had some questions. I'm ahead of the game. I don't believe it. I finally caught up. Oh, so we will have enough. I, I usually, if I had time, I would, I just, uh, questions, I just had some questions. Starch can be separated, separated by fats or oils, examples. Give me some examples you want. Hmm? Examples. Uh, yeah, starch and granules that, that require fat and oil to be separated, which is gravy, typical gravy or cream soup and all that. We talked about those, you know. Basically, uh, there, there were four different, four or five different uh, souffles sometimes and, uh, yeah. And for um, starch granules could be separated by cold, uh, by cold the liquid would be what? By cold liquid would be a cornstarch. Yeah. Uh, fine powdery ingredients, dry fine pine, could be separated by another fine powdery ingredient, such as what? Like chocolate powder. If you use cornstarch, use chocolate powder to separate it. Or use sugar, if not use sugar. And we will have some examples in the Mila lab for you to try out. Okay. Gelatinization, of course, depends on ratio of liquid to starch, of course. The more starch you put in, the thicker it's going to be, of course. But the temperature is very important. Only take it to certain, don't take it to a point that implosion is going to occur. That means it gets pasty. People could tell if it's a pasty gravy. Then, yeah, you said, what is that? Raw starch almost like. So not too fast, but slow enough, be patient until it gets to the right consistency or maximum cons consistency beyond which implosion could occur. Okay. So those are the questions. Do you have any questions? I'm caught up in the next two weeks after this week. We've got all kinds of products we can make. It'll be very interesting, and I will talk to Emil. We will reverse. Like if you made two products this week, the next week you make two other products, so you basically have all the essential products uh, covered, and uh, have hopefully uh, a good experience in making these products. You have any questions? Oh, by the way, uh, I have not read your lab reports yet. I purposely want to wait until 5 o'clock today because my lab is Monday morning. So there were already a lot of questions. I said <laughs> I don't want to answer them because it would not be fair. Okay, because the other two groups, 
will be will be the deadline turning basically a mill will not read them until like tomorrow five o'clock I will read them um, five o'clock today I know <laughs> it is a big event on television I know but I mean say anytime after after that I will read and then he will read Thursday so afterwards I will take a look my only question is some references it partially my fault I didn't give you an example how to quote okay so this is the oh, I already read quickly but I have not given you points but I, but I will do the best I can because I didn't get a chance to tell you ahead of time but I, I should at least get the source where it's coming from that if I want to look for it I could find it at least what date did I give the lecture and what page what lecture the lecture on what and that kind of information or if you quoted on the textbook which page is that page number so I could find it if I were to find it of course I'm not going to try to find it it's only a practice so everybody's done it a little differently so but anyway I will make some comments next uh, I'll do the best I can this week that's all the first week okay any question oh oh yes the lab report uh, do this week and do whatever you you would like all of you could do the mayonnaise if you want because our groups all of our groups five groups made a mayonnaise they made a permanent emulsion and they made a temporary emulsion and then the the salad dressing the vinaigrette so if you want to do that you could do that but we, we, we did a potato salad because we had some extra white and red potatoes so we made some potato salad to see the consistency of the potatoes so we didn't get a chance to do last week but you could do whatever you did to, uh, to the, you know in your lab time uh, but there is enough for you to talk about in mayonnaise whether you it failed or not half of the half the group failed or half were very successful making good mayonnaise and it was enough for us to to taste and to have fun today we had we had fun today yeah but it, even if the product failed does not matter it does not mean that you cannot get a hundred percent you still can it's just the way you're going to explain why it failed okay